Good morning and welcome to Regency Park. We're so glad you guys are here today. We've got a ton of announcements going on, but do you know why I like it when we have a ton of announcements going on? Because it says that our, our church is alive and well and doing some awesome things for Jesus. Amen? Yeah, so I think that's so great. So welcome if this is your first time. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us, but we would love to say hello and get to know you a little bit. So we'd love to have you stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby and fill out a Connect card just so we can say hello. And again, welcome. Um, also, if you are needing um, assistance with translation from English to Spanish, you can see um, Pastor Victor in the back and he can get you um, some ear uh, or a headset so that you can hear um, translation of the service. We'd love to have that out for you. Also, we are just a church who believes in prayer. Amen. That's right, and we um, want to invite you to a new prayer time every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., meeting right back into the joy room, and we'd love to have you join us for that. We pray for our church, our community, our students, our kids, and so it's just a great time to come and to, to reach out to the Lord together corporately um, as a body of believers. And with that, we have an opportunity. You know, we've got Sulk Elementary, our school that's just down the road, and the end of this month, we have the opportunity to be able to go and do a prayer walk in the halls of their school on Sunday, the 28th of April. So if you're interested in that, we're going to meet at the school at noon. Um, the principal is going to come and open the, the doors for us to just walk the halls and cover that place in prayer. So you won't want to miss out on having that opportunity. Amen. Yeah, that's great. So y'all are clapping. That means you're, you're all going to be there, right? Okay. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, <laughs> um, we, again, we just do believe in prayer so much here. And then, yes, the next thing that we have today and next week um, after, or yeah, today, yeah, today and next week. Sorry, I was getting my dates mixed up. Um, we've got this is Regency Park. And it just helps go through, if you're newer to the church, um, the things that we believe as a church, um, what what we're doing, and then how you can be connected in that. So we'd love to have you join us um, after service today in the fireside room. Um, that would be wonderful. And then the last thing, we've got church elections coming up. We do this every year. And so um, in a couple of Sundays on April 28th, we'll have ballots in the lobby, and you'll get the chance to vote on a church board, district assembly delegates, all of those fun churchy things, the business of the church. Um, but be in prayer for that as well right? Because we don't just believe God's just putting some random names on a ballot. We believe God is anointing people to be a part of our leadership here. So we want to make sure that um, we have the right people in the right places. So I think that I've got all the announcements for today. So that's a lot of fun things. But we get to now um, go to the Lord with worship and praise. And we get to do that by starting with the reading of his word together. If anyone needs a campaign manager, if you're running for office, just let me know. Where did that come from? Please stand. We are a church that prays, amen? Yes. And Paul, to the Colossians, writes these uh, encouragement words for prayer. And he writes, devote yourselves to prayer, to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about this mysterious plan concerning Christ. Yes, I'll repeat that. Listen close, church. Pray for us, too. That's us today that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. And that is why Paul says, I am here in prison in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Thanks be to God. Amen. What a great reminder to be praying for each other and praying for your leadership. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Let 
And in just a moment, we're going to continue our worship and praise through coming to the Lord's table together in communion. And the song is going to set the tone very well for us. So Christ be magnified. And then nothing but the blood of Jesus can cleanse us and make us whole. So in just a moment, we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper together, but some really important instructions that I need to give you. God's Word tells us that this is a holy and a sacred time, one not to be entered into life. So as we're preparing to receive the elements freely given for you and for me, it's an excellent opportunity for you to search your heart. Is there anything hindering your relationship with your Heavenly Father? And if so, why not take a few moments while this song is being sung? Confess those sins to God and experience what His Word says. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just some really important other details, my friends. You do not have to be a member of our church to partake of the elements. We invite all who have given their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior to freely come. And if you've not yet made that decision, don't wait another moment. Right now, here in this moment, I pray that you'll hear the voice of your Savior calling, come. Come receive new life in my name. You can do that right here and right now. In the quiet of this moment, just cry out, Jesus, I need a Savior. I'm sorry for the things that I've done. Right here and right now, I confess my sins and I give my life to you. That's what you need to do in this moment. What a perfect time to do so. But in just a moment, I'll have our usher stationed at various places throughout this worship center. You can go to any of those stations. Gluten-free elements are available at the back station this direction. Otherwise, all the other stations will be the same. And when you receive the elements, please bring them back to where you're seated. And we will partake of the body and the blood when our song is completed. A song of worship, prepare our hearts for you. Ushers, would you please come? And as the ushers are getting themselves placed, when you feel as though the Lord has prompted your heart, then and only then, please come receive the elements and make your way back to your seat with them. We will partake of them together as one body today.
God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were far, while we were broken, when there was nothing we could do to undo the damage that we had done in our life, our God did something miraculous. He took our place. And because of that precious blood of Jesus that flowed, we can be forgiven and free. That's what we do when we come to the table. I pray that your heart is prepared with all the gratitude that you can offer, with all the worship from the very top of your head to the tip of your toes, express that name that's above every other name, Jesus, as we come to this table together today. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which has been given for you and for me. Take and eat in remembrance that Christ's body was given for you, and be forever grateful. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for you and for me for the forgiveness of your sins and of mine. Take and drink and remember that Christ's blood was spilled for you and be forever grateful. Lord Jesus, as we sang just a moment ago, we pray that in moments like this that you will be magnified in our life. That in these moments and times we remember this is so much more than just something we do. This is an experience with the God who loves us this much. May we never come to this spot where we feel sort of apathetic or unmoved because, Lord, there is no greater love than what you've just shown us, what we've just remembered, your sacrificial love and this gift that's been given unto us. So, Lord, I pray that we will be truly moved in this moment, that we will know that you love the person sitting in our chair right now. You loved us that much. And you're pouring this reminder, this opportunity to worship into our lives and that we may have with hands open wide to say, Christ, be magnified in my life. Not just in this moment, but may this moment motivate and compel us to share this good news. Yes, by the words that we speak, also, though, by the lives that we live. We are so grateful. How do we even put into words the gratitudes in our hearts for what it is that you have done for us? So may we truly live lives of worship in a way of saying thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, and your presence right here and right now. We believe you for it all, Jesus, and we ask it in your name. And everyone together said, amen and amen. And you may be seated. Good morning, church. Uh, last weekend, uh, Taylor Schlosser and I had the privilege of taking five of our students, five of our teenagers, down to Southern Nazarene University for extravaganza. And the extravaganza is a way for students from all over the region, region, so that's Oklahoma, Texas, uh, parts of Arkansas, Louisiana. All these students come together. They're able to participate in competitions and sports and music and arts and just a wide range of ways to show their talents and their gifts um, in a fun, competitive way. There's like a talent show, but they also have ways to build community and friendships with uh, other peers and churches. And then we had wonderful services each night. 
um, praise and worship and getting into God's word, um, which was really spoke to a lot of our hearts, I know. And the way that blesses me is because you guys have blessed us. A um, couple months ago, we had a dessert auction, and you guys so generously gave to our students, and that allowed them to have the opportunity to go. And we have camp coming up in a couple of months. And that generous giving allows these students to not have to worry about, well, I really want to go and participate, but where is this money going to come from? Now, I know that was a special event. Um, that was raising money for a special cause that's outside of our normal tithes and offerings. But I think if God can take your extras like that and bless so many people, what he really can do with our regular offering and our giving to him. Um, we just took communion. And I think our tithes and offerings are like an extension of that. It's a way that we say, Lord, I know what you've done for me. I know all that I have is from you, what you have provided for me. This is my way to praise you. Bless your name, Lord God, for what you have given me. Doesn't matter how little it is or how much it is, nothing goes to waste. And I don't know how many of you guys, when we were kids, we love getting presents for birthday and Christmas. And then as we grow up, or even as a parent, we love giving more than receiving. And I have learned, you know, Dave and I started out, we didn't have much, but we had been instilled since we were little from the church and from our parents that this was an important part of our faith and our growth and our relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's something that we need to do to give back to God. And so we just started, you know, we didn't have much, but we gave what we can, and we trust God with our best, and he does the rest. And I have learned through that that no matter what we give and nothing is wasted, it ends up coming full circle. And we are blessed in return. And so many times in double portion. And that doesn't mean that doubles our bank account, but it's what it does in here. So thank you all for your generous giving and your continued giving to see what the church can do, bless others through you. So we have a lot of ways to give here at the church, uh, numerous ways. In a minute, we're gonna be passing buckets. Simple, just start on one end of the row, pass the buckets down, set them on the floor on the other end if you want to just give right now. We also have um, a receptacle by the door there. You can drop your offering in um, on your way out the door if you prefer to do it that way. And also in this digital world that we live in, right, instant, everything's instant, we have a way to do that online too. Just go to our website and the Give tab. So if that's kind of something you prefer to do, you can give that way too. Um, so thank you so much for your generous giving and telling the Lord thank you and bless your name for all that you have done for us. Dear God, our hearts are broken for this world. The hatred is palpable, the division undeniable, and the pain runs deep. We desperately need more of you. We ask for your truth to be louder than the noise which surrounds us. For your mercy to be stronger than the voices of oppression. For your strength to overpower those who seek to do harm. Where there is division, bring unity. Where there is anger, bring peace. Where there is evil, bring victory. Empower us to fulfill your mission, to answer your calling, to be the light you've created us to be. May your love, your grace, and your mercy flood this world. We love you. We seek you. We place our hope in the mighty name of Jesus. This we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome back, friends. I'm so glad to see all your bright, smiley faces. Do me a favor. Turn and show your neighbor your bright, smiley faces. Yay. <laughs> Nicely done. Got some smiles. Gotcha. We're in a week two of this series. We started last week called Like a Good Neighbor, or if you were here last week, Like a Good Neighbor. And some of you did that all week and you annoyed your spouses and your family. You're welcome. That's my gift to you. 
But we looked at this idea of what does it mean for us to embrace this, to be good neighbors. And so uh, since we're on this subject of neighbors, it got me thinking, there are some very famous neighbors in the world, aren't there? Anyone a product of TV growing up like I was? Lots of famous neighbors on TV. As a matter of fact, let me just show you some famous neighbors, and I bet you have a pretty good idea of who they are. Um, this first neighbor was from the 90s, a show called Full House. Anyone remember who this neighbor was? Kimmy Gibbler. Kimmy Gibbler. Good job, everyone. Everyone remembers a Kimmy Gibbler. Now let's throw it way back. Anyone remember a show called Leave It to Beaver? There's a neighbor in this guy. Anyone remember who this is? Eddie, right, our neighbor Eddie, kind of a schmoozer, a little bit of a schmoozer guy, right? Um, if you were a fan of Tim the Tool Man Taylor, there was a neighbor, you never saw his whole face. Do you remember Wilson? And Tim would always go, if he needed some wisdom, he'd go talk to his neighbor across the, the fence yard, and he never saw his whole face, and it drove me nuts. Um, I think one of the funniest neighbors of all time took place during a 90s show. This is it, this, Seinfeld, I didn't remember this guy's name. Kramer, right? Very, very funny. But I think the most annoying neighbor of all time award goes to this guy from another 90s show. Anyone remember him? <laughs> Urkel. Anyone remember his catchphrase? Did I do that? Yeah, see? Television has shaped us, everyone. <laughs> hey, here's the point to this story, not just for basically 90s TV pop culture, but every one of those neighbors was known for something. They had a neighborly reputation. So uh, Wilson was known as the wise neighbor. Urkel was known as that annoying neighbor. Um, Kramer was known as kind of the funny neighbor, the little off-kilter neighbor. And it got me thinking what we talked about last week. When others would see us coming, what would they say of us as neighbors? What would be our neighborly reputation? Hopefully it wouldn't be, oh, here come those annoying Regency Park people. <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't hide from us. Maybe we'd be known as people of wisdom. That would be great. Like the neighbor Wilson. People that are very wise people. Maybe we make them laugh like Kramer does. But the question is, of course, what is our neighborly reputation? And we set the tone last week of saying really more than what anyone else would want us to be known as. We want to be known as what Jesus said. Because he said, love your neighbor as yourself. So this idea that we have been looking into is, are we truly loving? When our neighbors think of us, when they hear of us, do they think that is a loving group of people? Do they see us as Christ-like agape love flowing through us? And that's why last week we looked at, well, what does that even mean to love your neighbors yourself? We said Jesus gave this incredible example through a story called the Good Samaritan, where someone was beat up and left for dead on the side of the road. And the most unlikely of candidates came and helped him. And the moral of the story was, what it means to be a good neighbor is when life has beat you up and left you for dead on the side of the road, however you would want someone to love you in that moment, that's what it means to love others. In other words, that that is what it looks like to be agape loving. Christ-like loving to your neighbor. And then Jesus did something mind-blowing. He said, and anyone you meet in the human race, that is your neighbor. Whoo, mind-blowing stuff. And I pray that last week you took to heart what it is that we learned. I sent you home with a challenge. I said, who are five of your neighbors? We said, the, give me five, Lord. Who are your five? Not physical neighbors. We said, your school neighbors, your online neighbors, your work neighbors, your coffee shop neighbors. Who are those five neighbors? And then we challenge you to do one good Samaritan-like loving thing for them. Could have been as simple as writing them a note, dropping off a meal, being a listening ear. Introvert things and extrovert things, however God's put you together, I pray that you did that, that you took a step towards doing what Jesus said is one of the most important commands, loving your neighbor as yourself. Speaking of which, that is our theme verse. I've challenged you to memorize these five words. So if you'd be so kind, put Matthew twenty two thirty nine 39 up there for me. We're going to go ahead and say this together, these simple five words. Ready? Let's say them together. Love your neighbor as yourself. I pray you're doing that. We're going to learn more of what it means each week. Put layers onto this and understand what Jesus meant and what it looks like to love this out. So the question that's been guiding us is this. What does it mean to be a good neighbor to our neighbors? Well, what did Jesus mean by this? And so what does it look like? And today we're going to find 
If you're ever going to be a loving neighbor, you've got to embrace this thing. If you're ever going to know Jesus' way of loving it, then you have to embrace this thing called prayer. I love this, what Mary Schaller actually says. When it comes to loving people toward Jesus, prayer is not optional. So prayer has to make its way to the top of the list. And so what does that look like? And what does that mean to love people towards Jesus through prayer? We're going to look at that today. However you've got God's word, would you please open it up to me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 26. And for those of you who are new, Acts is actually a shortened title, which means the Acts of the Apostles. So the actions, the things the apostles, those first followers of Jesus did. So that's what this word Acts means. It's not like a chopping Acts. It's a Acts as in actions of the apostles. And here we see this guy named Paul, one of those apostles of Jesus, and he's actually defending his faith. He's brought before King Agrippa, and it's a long story. I don't have time to read it all for you. But in this defense, you actually see, I believe, things that Paul is desiring for the neighbors, the not yet believers in his life to discover. And in this powerful defense, I think we see some things that we could be praying for. How do we pray in a way that we love our neighbors more towards Jesus? That's what we're going to look at today. So Acts chapter 26, beginning with verse 12, would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's message today? As we always do here, take just a minute, would you prepare your heart, just bow your head and close your eyes for a second. Would you ask the Lord to still any distractions, anything that's keeping you from focusing on him? Would you tell him that you're hungry to hear from him today? through his word and his Holy Spirit. Amen. This is God's word for us. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, this is Paul speaking, armed with the authority and commission of of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. We fell down and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord, I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Would you pray with me today? Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. May none of us leave the same as when we came in. But know that we've experienced the living God in our midst, and may we be softened, may we be convicted, may we be called out and challenged, and most of all transformed, that we all look more like you, Jesus, because of what you've done here as we've gathered as your people today. We believe you for it all, Jesus, and ask it in your name. And everybody said, Amen. amen. You may be seated. How many of you have ever found yourself doing a project, a task, or an assignment that was going to take a while? A big, massive project. Want anyone? Yeah, quite a few of us. I mean, I'm not talking about those weekend projects. Yeah, I'm not talking about those ones that you're like, hey, it'll take a night. I'm talking about bigger things. Let, let me give you some example. Maybe you decided to rebuild an engine, right? I'm going to rebuild this engine. I'm going to mechanic this thing. It's probably not something you're like, I got a couple hours. I'll get that done. If you've done that, you know that it takes some time. Maybe for others of you decided to run a marathon. Woohoo, 26.2 miles. That's incredible. And you're like, this isn't something you just wake up one day and decide to do. You got to do some training. You got to get ready because that is a lot of miles. 26.2 miles to be exact. Maybe for others of you, that big project that you were working on, that you were getting ready for, you had to psych yourself up for was this. You decided that you were going to fold a fitted sheet. All right? How many of you have ever tried to fold a fitted sheet before? Right? Is that not a big project? This is a how to. I felt like this was really helpful for me when I fold my fitted sheets. How to fold a fitted sheet. There's step one in the upper left hand corner, step two, step three, and then step four, it ends up where? In a burning trash can, right? That's the only place for your fitted sheets to go. It's interesting, sometimes these things can seem so challenging because it's hard to know even where to begin. Like, where do I even start? 
Rebuilding an engine, like I barely know where the oil goes. And if I'm going to have to put, you know, the new hyphen dufinator on there, I don't know where all this stuff goes. I don't know what this means. It's hard to know even where to begin. Or running a marathon. You may think, like 26 miles in a row? Like, I don't think I've run 26 combined miles in my life and I have to do it all at one time. Where do I even start? And folded a fitting sheet? You're like, I think that's an urban myth. I don't think it's possible. I think people are just making this up, right? All this fake news out there. It's interesting when you have a big project or assignment in front of you, sometimes knowing where to begin is one of the hardest things. And sometimes maybe you've been hearing this, this command that Jesus gives, which he couldn't be more clear. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you felt a similar thing. How do I, how do I even start? Maybe you've been honest with Jesus. You know, Jesus, I struggle some days just to make toast. You know, or keep a plant alive, or, or wear matching clothes, or walk and chew gum at the same time. Jesus, maybe I should just work on mastering folding a fitted sheet first, and then I'll get to the loving of my neighbor parts. Or maybe you've even looked back at Jesus and you've said, Jesus, I know things were different in your day than in my day, but I, I just need to let you know, have you, have you met my neighbors? I mean, have you met Mark from marketing, and, and Sally from sales, Beth the barista literally has it out for me. She draws frowny faces on my coffee mug before she gives it to me in the morning. She does not like me. And you want me to love these type of people? Because Jesus, loving people is a really hard thing. It, it reminds me of a letter I heard from a, a little young girl named Nan one time who was struggling with, this, with God. And this is the letter that she actually wrote to God. She said, dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family and I can never do it, right? You're like, yeah, man, we, we, we totally get that. Sometimes it's hard to know where to start, but my friends, I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's not easy. It's, Jesus even goes a little bit farther uh, later on in one of his teachings, saying, not only just love your neighbor, but love your enemies. So, I mean, enemies and neighbors and everyone, Jesus is just all about loving people. And so you're like, well, Keith, then what's the point? Because I can't do that. And in some regard, I want to say, yeah, you're right. But there's more to the story. The good news is, Jesus hasn't asked you to do it on your own. That he desires to empower you to do that which he has called you to do. And you and I have been given a secret weapon. And that secret weapon is, it's prayer. That prayer has this incredible power to do something in our lives. As a matter of fact, I love this passage from James chapter 5 verse 16. It says this, the prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces Wonderful results. Can I ask you to see that again? That first underlined phrase, it has what kind of power? It has great power. I'm not talking little power to get you through a day. It has great, enormous power, and it produces what? Wonderful results. My friends, when it comes down to this idea of loving each other, please don't try to do it without the power of prayer. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you. But when you begin to pray, when you begin to enlist that great power, you begin to see those wonderful results. You start to see people's hearts become softened. Your neighbors, there's this love that begins to be birthed inside of you, even though you don't necessarily care for them. Something deeper happens in your spirit. I love how a, a pastor by the name of Lon Allison says it this way. He has this incredible quote for prayer, and here's what he says. It is the prayers of God's people that break down the strongholds that the enemy holds over the people in our lives who do not know God. This is huge, my friends. So I want to tell you something. This is going to be so freeing for some of you. My friends, you don't have to save anybody. You don't have to change anybody. You don't have to transform anybody. As a matter of fact, I've got some sad news for some of you today. And here it is. Um, that you're not God, Okay. Let me say it this way. There's a God, and it is not you. Okay, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that. There's a God, and it is not you. Ready? Okay. Just a moment. I was breaking down. So we're like, yeah, I already knew that. Guess what? Only God can save. Only God can change a heart. Only God can transform. That's his job. You don't have to do what you cannot do. But guys, here's what we do get to do. We get to pray. Because prayer opens the door for God's amazing, wonder-working power to begin poured out into people's lives. And that's what I pray we'll do today. What would it look like if we actually lovingly prayed for our neighbors? And this is what I wanted us to see in the passage today. Paul's sitting there before this guy named King Agrippa. And it's this huge story. You've you got to read it in the book of Acts. It's a really incredible story. 
And in this story, Paul says that he's desiring things. And I was drawn to four of the verbs in here, and so I underlined for them. And I want you to see what I was drawn to when it came for Paul's desires for the people in his life. He said this, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, that they would receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people. So I see four. I see openness, I see turning, I see receiving, and I see giving. And so I thought about that today. How can we make this a catchy way and, and, and really understand that those are the four things that we can pray for for our neighbors. Openness, turning, receiving, to be given. So I thought, well, the only way I know is we're going to keep going with this theme every, good, every week. We're going to say this. So today is, like a good neighbor, Regency praise. Isn't that good? I'm not going to invite you to sing that with me because you're like, I don't even know what key you were in, Keith. I think you're in four keys there. That's okay. I'm not the singer in the family. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. Like a good neighbor, Regency prays for openness, prays for turning, prays for receiving, prays for giving. And to hopefully help this set a little bit more, I wanted to go back to our fun little porch environment. I've got some visuals that I want to help us walk through today. So this first thing that we want to pray for is we want to pray that our neighbors will be open to open their eyes or with an openness. Now, if you've ever been to a porch before, the door is closed. Maybe they've even made it a little bit more friend, not so friendly, right? Sorry, we're closed. If you've ever been to a neighbor, a co-working neighbor, a school neighbor, and this is the posture that they had, there's only so much you can do when a door is closed, right? I mean, short of a felony, okay? So, but please don't commit a felony, okay? You don't have to tell your neighbors that, do you? Like, we know that. Yeah, don't commit a felony. But you can knock a few times. You can peer through the window. That gets a little creepy. I, I would be careful on that one, right? Look around for other doors. Maybe ask a neighbor where they are. But if there's a closed door, there's only so much you can do. They can't see your smiling face when you're there at the door if it's closed. They can't receive your home-baked goodies. They can't get your invitation when there's a closed door. So what's the first thing that we are called to pray for? Pray that God would open their eyes, that he'd change their posture from closed to open. Because when there's openness in a conversation, everything changes, right? Suddenly there's hope. Suddenly there's opportunity. Suddenly they get a chance to taste your delicious pie. And if they taste it, you know that's the open door that you need. So pray for that openness when it comes to your relationships with your neighbors as you try to love them. Pray for what kind of openness? Pray, Lord Jesus, help them to be open. Just open for a conversation. Open for a friendship. Open for a play date. Open for us to just walk our dogs together. Because if they're closed, there's only so much you can do. But my friends, if the Lord opens the door, if they're open, not closed, suddenly there's hope and opportunity again. Lord, open their eyes. The second thing we could pray for is this. It says that they will turn. We're going to pray for a turning. So that they turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. I was thinking about how to illustrate this, and I've got these lovely plants that I felt like would do a great job of showing what we're talking about today. Um, these plants are fake plants, but don't they look wonderful? Thank you. They're receiving enough artificial sunlight and then all the fun things, but if you've ever seen a plant that's been stuck in the shade or in shadows, something interesting happens. Think about it in your own life. Maybe you have some in your house. That God has equipped certain plants with something called phototropism. You know what this is? It's when a plant actually turns towards light. I think I've got a picture of it right up here. Have you ever seen a plant do this? That it's when it's stuck in the shadows, it must grow towards light. Why? Because it needs light, photosynthesis, to grow, to produce it. all of these essence for the nutrients that it needs. And so I thought about that for a minute. I thought, well, these are fake plants, but how great would it be if we had like a little turn? Isn't that nice? may look a little funny to you, but I think it's a good thing if we turned a little bit. And I thought about this for a moment when we're praying, just like a plant turns because it can't be in darkness and thrive, it has to find the light. And the cool thing about how God has made certain plants is some of them do exactly that. They turn towards the light. What if we prayed the same thing for our neighbors? How many of you know, like I do, that there are some shady places in this world? And some of our people 
that we love and care for, some of our godly needing neighbors, they're stuck in darkness. And what they need more than anything else, if they're ever going to thrive, if they're ever going to grow, they're going to need a turning towards the sun. And you know I'm not talking about turning towards the S-U-N, right? I'm talking about turning towards the S-O-N. If they need to turn towards Jesus, what would happen if we prayed that? Lord Jesus, turn them away from darkness and towards you. I want to make sure that you catch that in our passage today that we read. It said that turn from darkness to light. Turn from the power of Satan to the power of God. Sometimes in the world that we live in, when it comes to this neighboring, why it becomes so hard, we've got to be bold about it, my friends. That's because we have an adversary out there. You know that, right? That we have someone who's fighting against the work and the will of God. We have a real enemy. His name is the devil or Satan. And he's fighting against this. And that's why we have to know, my friends, our prayer is that they would turn away from the darkness and towards the light that God has for them. It's a reminder, my friends, that we are not neutral in this war. I love this quote that C.S. Lewis says. I actually brought a C.S. Lewis quote last week. Here's another one. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So the idea for us is to realize, my friends, that we would pray that they would turn from darkness to light. They would turn from the power of Satan towards God. And just like when you see a plant and you're like, what's going on with this plant? It's turned. That we would see that same turning take place for our neighbors and our workplaces and our schools online. Turn from darkness and towards that light. That's the second thing. The third thing is this. I like how it says is that they would receive the forgiveness of sins. So we're praying that they would receive. For them to receive, that they will receive forgiveness for their sins. Now, keeping in line with our little illustration here on the front porch, quick question. Anyone here like me and like to receive packages? Raising your hands. Very good. How many of you would be bold and brave enough to admit that you may have a little bit of an Amazon addiction? (laughs) Anyone here ever ordered something and you forgot what it was when a box arrived on your front porch? Then it's like a little surprise, isn't it? Like, oh, I didn't know I got this. This is fun. This is wonderful. So I started to think about this. Many of us receive packages like this when it comes to our neighborhoods, our front doors. And I thought, just for fun, let's see, what are those things that are the most received so far in a society today? And here's what I found. The first one is this, the uh, Stanley Tumbler. How many of you have heard of these and couldn't find one anyways? This is the most received gift so far in 2024. And I'm sure if you have one, your beverage tastes 100 times better, right? I'm sure it just tastes magical now. That's the most thing that people have received so far from Amazon this year. The second thing is this, a Zulily milk frother to help make your delicious coffee items. Because we're a coffee-obsessed society, good job, America. I'm proud of you, all right? And then the third thing is this, the CeraVe, um, like, face dry, moisturizer for your face. And some of you are thinking, well, I was looking for another good moisturizing cream, and, and that would be wonderful. Now, what's the point of all this? Here's the point. These are kind of fun things to receive. If I receive a coffee gift, I'm pretty excited. Like, Keith, you're always excited. I know, but I'm even more excited when I get coffee. Of all these things to receive, a Stanley Tumber, maybe some moisturizing cream, that's a really wonderful thing to receive, my friends. And I pray that our neighbors receive really, really wonderful things. But my friends, can I make sure that we remember that the greatest thing of all that our neighbors could receive isn't a Stanley Tumbler tumbler or or a milk frother or CeraVe moisturizing lotion. The greatest thing of all that they could receive is the knowledge of Jesus Christ's love for them. That they could be forgiven of their sins. My friends, I'm here to tell you that greatest gift of all, it doesn't come in a box. It comes through a cross. Right, that this is the gift that God has given us. And every time we see a cross, every time it's displayed, every time we walk by one, my prayer is that we'll begin to remember that the greatest thing that they could ever receive is what our passage says, for the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. I know for some of you, you're like, yeah, well, Pastor, I, I pray for my neighbors from time to time, you know, especially when I hear them, they're yelling or they're mad at each other and they take my parking spot or they shoot their grass clippings into my yard. Oh, well, I'll pray for them then, you know. But I thought about that. Of all the things I've prayed for my neighbors, my neighbors have asked me, hey, would you pray that I would have a safe trip? Sure. Would you pray that my car would start? Absolutely. Would you pray that my kids would behave? Oh, yes, I will, right? Would you pray that our marriage would thrive? Yeah. But can I just ask you something that I was convicted of when I read this? 
I was convicted of the fact of when's the last time I actually prayed that my neighbors would receive the forgiveness of sins through Jesus? When's the last time? Do we ever pray that they will receive forgiveness for their sins? My friends, I'm telling you, all of those things, your milk frother is going to be awesome, but it ain't going into eternity with you. Either is your Stanley mug. (laughs) My friends, this gift of all, could we pray that that which Paul says, which the gospel says is so critical, could we take time to pray that they would receive forgiveness for their sins? What an incredible thing for us to receive. Not just the cool items that come in a box, but the greatest gift of all. That gift of Jesus' forgiveness. So those three things. And, and what's the fourth thing? It says this, that they would be given. I love that they would be given a place among God's people. So for this one, I wanted to bring out my rocking chair. If you stop by our house one time, and you're welcome to stop by our house, you'll see two of these awesome things. We've got two rocking chairs. There's one for me, this is mine, and then Reagan has one that looks just like it. And now that we live in Oklahoma and not in a freezing wintry tundra, sometimes we'll sit out there on the porch and we'll just rock back and forth. You're like, you are so old, Pastor. Yeah, maybe I am, but we'll, we'll watch as people walk by. There's tons of walkers in our neighborhood. And for us, this feels like home sweet home. It's a place for us. We feel relaxed, we feel settled, we feel comfortable here. It's a really cool thing for us to do. We've had many conversations in these things, maybe not as many as we could, but lots of them. And I thought about this, I thought, isn't it great to have a place you can call home sweet home? A chair that's waiting for you, people that know you, people that wave back at you. My friends, when it comes to the neighbors in our lives, what would happen if we prayed the same thing? You know, that's what the gospel says. We would pray that they would be given a place among God's people. Remember what I challenged you to do just a few months ago? I said there's probably an empty chair sitting somewhere by you. So do me a favor, my friends. Just locate an empty chair by you right now, okay? Look at it. Call it. Put your hand on it. Whatever. Remember what I said our goal is? That next year at this time, someone will be sitting in that chair because of how God used you. What Paul said, what the gospel said, is true for us. And not just that they sit in that chair, but they'll feel like, this place is for me. I have a place among God's people. This is home sweet home to me. I can sit in that rocking chair and be a part of what God is doing in this place and know that I am valuable here. When I walk in that front door, they know my name and it matters that I'm here. It matters that I'm a part I think sometimes what's happened with the church in modern times today is become, we've become such a service-oriented thing that we've missed on what it means to be a community. What would it look like if we became that place where I am needed, I am known, and there is a place for me, and we're not as good when I'm not a part? That's what Paul says. Pray that they would be given a place in God's family. What would it look like if we prayed for openness? If we prayed for this turning, if we prayed that they would receive and we prayed that they would be given, I think something incredible would happen. So that's what I'm going to challenge you to do this week, my friends. Ready? You're getting the five by five challenge, all right? You're getting the five by five challenge. I'm going to invite you to pray for those five people for five minutes every single day this week. And I'm going to challenge you to pray for these things. Pray for them to be open. Come on in, we're open. Open to a conversation, open to a friendship, open to a play date, open to just smiling at each other. Open that they would have some sort of turning in their life. Maybe that turning happens from from an addiction. Maybe that turning happens from some struggles that they've been having, but a turning from darkness to light that they would receive that forgiveness of God and they would feel like, man, now what's my next step? And you say, I've been saving a seat for you this whole time. Why don't you come? Find your place in God's family. That's my prayer for us. That we would do this five by five challenge every day, my friends. You're like, how can I pray for five minutes? It's easy. Five names, one minute per name. Just saying the words openness and turning and receiving and to be given, those types of things, that's 10 seconds right there. You only got 50 to go. Pray for these people and see what God does. My friends, I think we greatly underestimate the power of prayer when it comes to loving our neighbors. I want to invite our praise team to come forward. We're going to sing a song as we close in just a minute. But I had to share this story with you. I think it's such an incredible story. Anyone ever heard of a guy named George Mueller? 
George Mueller was a really incredible guy um, in the 1800s, an amazing follower of Jesus, but I love this story. It says, in the book, George Mueller, Man of Faith and Miracles, he shares of when he began praying for five not yet believing neighbors in his life. And this is how the story goes. In November, November 1844, I began to pray for the con conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, on the land or in the sea, whether the pressure of my engagements might be. 18 months elapsed before the first of the five was converted. I thanked God and prayed for the second one, or prayed for the others. Five years elapsed and then the second one was converted. I thanked God for the second and prayed for the other three. Day by day, I continued to pray for them, and six years passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the third and went on praying for the other two. It has been 52 years for two men, the sons of a friend of my youth. They are not converted yet, but they will be. How could it be otherwise? Shortly after Mueller's death in 1898, the two young men for whom he had prayed over half a century turned to God. It is hard to overstate the power of prayer for our not yet believing neighbors. Five by five, my friends. What would it look like if we did the same thing? So I'm gonna challenge us to do something a little different as we close the service today. First of all, I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet. Would you please stand with me as we pray in just a moment? I'm actually going to challenge you to take a step of faith today. Sometimes the hardest step is the first step. So I'm going to invite you all to literally take some physical steps forward and gather here around these altars and around this neighborly front door. And I'm going to intercede over you and we're going to intercede for those people that you are praying for. In other words, that means that you are going to stand in the gap for them. And we're just going to spend some time in prayer for those five neighbors that you are praying for now. I know sometimes that first step is the hardest, and that's why we're all going to do it together. Everyone who's comfortable, if you're not, you don't have to do it. You run for the door. It's okay. But here's what I'm challenging. Would you be brave and bold enough? Because sometimes if you could just take that first step, then the second step becomes a whole lot easier. So here's what I'd love for you to do. If you're feeling so inclined, I'd love to invite you, each and every one of you. You're, you're praying for a not yet believing husband or, or wife or grandkids or kids or neighbors, whoever it may be, what if that same thing that happened through George Mueller's prayers could happen through yours? Wouldn't you want to see that same thing happen? So I want to invite you, come on, let's come fill this front, my friends. Let's pray over our neighbors. Let's take that first step of faith and believe that there is power, that there is something incredible that happens. And this represents those neighbors in your school, online, wherever it is that you may be. We're going to just in place of them, interceding for them. We're going to fill these aisles, fill this front, and we're going to bring them all to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to bring my chair up of all the names that we have been praying for as our neighbors. I want to invite you to do something, my friends. Just extend a hand outwards towards this chair as a representation. And you know those names. Just for a minute, close your eyes, bow your heads. Would you recall those names? Speak them by name right now in this moment to the Lord who it is that you are praying for in your mind. Just bring them before the Lord. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord, we gather here because we believe in the promise of your word where it says in James 5, 16 that the earnest prayers of a righteous person, they have great power and they produce wonderful results. So in this moment, we bring before you these names that are on our hearts, these names that are not yet connected to you or have wandered far from you. And we believe that you are a God that still makes new things happen, that you still bring back to life those things that seem that they are far gone conclusions and they're forgotten. That you are a God that still restores brokenness, that you are a God that still saves even those sinners who seem that they are so far from you that it can never, ever happen. Lord God, with faith we come before you and we pray, would you open their eyes? Would you give openness for conversations, for moments that we can connect with them? Would you allow them to turn from those dark situations that they may find themselves in, in their homes and in their schools and in their workplaces? May they turn to that light which is you, Jesus, that they may find the S-O-N son that they need. Father, we pray that of the greatest thing ever that they could receive, that they would receive that gift of salvation in your name, Jesus, and that they would find a home, that they would be given a place here in your body, the body of Christ, where they can learn and grow and live and strive together to be more and more like you, Jesus. 
We believe this is just a foretaste of what's about to come. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do this week through these faithful servants who have said, Lord, more than anything else, we just want to do what you've called us to do. We want to love our neighbors as ourselves, as you've commanded us to. And as we do that, we're believing for great and incredible things to take place. We ask it all in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. And everyone together said, amen and amen. Thank you so much for coming and praying, my friends. Now go and love your neighbors and know that the Lord goes with you. You are dismissed.